thanks everyone for uh, for coming uh, today. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I am coming to you from, which is the Yulikit Willen clan of the Boonarong people. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to the people in the lands from which you are all situated on. I'd also like to acknowledge that we are in a climate crisis that is affecting people and communities already in severe and life-threatening ways, many of whom are already marginalised by global extractive capitalism. Uh, my name is Sam Keast. I'm a researcher at BU and collaborator with the Community Identity and Displacement Research Network, or CIDRIN, uh, mm -hmm. as it's known. CIDRIN is a public intellectual space that investigates new diasporas and changing meanings of displacement and identity. It's a space where new questions about sense of place and community, um, social inclusion, transnationalism, racialization, and indigeneity can be raised, debated, and discussed. We're a multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary network that builds relationships with other institutions, organizations, governments, and communities to foster research and action towards community wellbeing and justice. Um, so if you're interested in finding out more about our projects or upcoming seminars, um, you can find us at communityidentity.com.au. Um, perhaps I can ask uh, Roshani or someone to put the links to our other socials in there. Um, we've got uh, past projects, as I said, publications that have come out of the group um, and some video recordings. And hopefully um, today's recording uh, will also be up there. Uh, so um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Um, just some small housekeeping before we start. As I mentioned, we are recording the session today. Uh, it's going to run pretty much like uh, probably most of the Zoom, <laughs> Zooms you've been involved in. Uh, Mario is going to present for a, a while, um, and then we're going to invite people to ask questions or, or have a conversation. Um, you're also free to use the chat function as you um, as a part of that. So. Uh, we're really uh, grateful and terribly excited to have Mario kick off our uh, 2021 uh, seminar series for Sidron. Um, Mario Pueca is a senior research fellow at the Institute for Sustainable Industries and Livable Cities at Victoria University uh, and a senior, senior fellow at the Centre for Analysis of the Radical Right. Um, he's also executive member of the International Think Tank Consortium, Chris CRIS, which is the Centre for Resilient and Inclusive Societies. He's undertaken qualitative and quantitative research on radical political movements, Muslim community activism, and inclusion exclusion dynamics since 2003, both in Europe and uh, in Australia. Uh, Mario has also contributed to consultations with various national and international agencies, including the United Nations, the Council of Europe, and the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Today, he's presenting uh, his work titled Exploring Far-Right Dynamics and Local Vulnerabilities, Vulnerabilities, Insights from Three Victorian Case Studies. It seems particularly pertinent given the headlines uh, this morning I noted um, regarding ASIO redefining how they frame these kinds of dynamics. Uh, and while these groups are often painted as extreme, as outside, as other, Mario's work seeks to understand them as part of our communities, our societies, as, and as belonging perhaps to a, a white settler history. Framing them as angry expressions of citizenship rather than through exclusionary discourses of violent extremism. Uh, so I'll hand over to Mario and we'll uh, come back at the end to uh, have a conversation, have some um, questions. Thanks, Mario. Thank you, Sam. That was very um, nice. Thank you for the invitation. This is a, a special moment. Um, I haven't presented this to such a broad audience, so it's, it's really exciting and I'm, I'm grateful to get this opportunity. I'm going to share the screen if I can. One second. So I just need a few, at least one note that you can see it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So normally I would like to do this a bit more interactively and in, in a discussion, but um, I think in this particular case, it's probably better for me to just talk about um, some of the, so the frame it to give you a bit of context first, and that probably takes about 15, 15 to 20 minutes. And then um, on the last slide, uh, where we look at different factors that, that influence vulnerabilities, I think we can do that a bit more openly or I can just keep talking. Let's see how we how we go. But um, obviously use chat function and, and everything and um, just get started. So the the 
I'm going to say a few words really briefly about the, the research project where this is all coming from, and then um, present, well, I said three local case studies. Actually, I'm going to talk primarily only about two to make it a bit more illustrative and a bit um, tighter. Um, Bendigo and Melton were two, were two um, far right conflicts escalated um, in the mid 2000s and late uh, mid 2010s. Um, the second, so I'm going to explain briefly what, what happened and then how did local government and civil society community groups, how did they respond to that? Um, that's the second main part. And, and then I'm trying to step back a bit, bit and drawing on all three local case studies um, that I'm going to you know, mention briefly in, in a second to give a bit of a, um, a more analytical overview on what factors influence, um, for example, whether uh, um, community response uh, immobilizes against far-right protests or whether they um, don't, things like that. So this is sort of a bit of an analytical part. And, and in, that, in that last part, um, I think it's, it's quite, it would be quite good to have this in a, in a more interactive and um, in a more interactive way where we can talk and you, you comment and, and ask or comment primarily. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the plan. The project was called Dissenting Citizenship, Understanding Vulnerabilities to Right-Wing Extremism on the Local Level. So the, the starting point was that we have done a lot of work on the far right in, in online spaces, but um, at some point I thought it would be, or that our team thought that it would be interesting to look at um, also what happens off, offline. Um, it's obviously a bit harder to get to that and to analyze that and to examine that, but that, that was the part that was an important element of this project it was conducted 2019 and 2020 and funded by the Victorian Department of Justice and Community Safety. Um, it was um, done as a team, team effort. Um, at VU, Ramon was, I think he's, he's here today, Ramon Sparge, Deborah, Deborah Smith and Scott Patton were part of the team. Um, the three local case studies were conducted in partnership, and then you see where the th what the three local case studies are, Bendigo, Milton, and Yera, and in partnership with those three local councils. And I think it's important to mention or to highlight that some people might think, why is Yera in there? Um, Yera is not really a, um, a hotspot of, of right-wing activism, you would think, but actually it was important to have it in there to, so we don't present Bendigo and Melton is sort of the, the bad boys in terms of municipalities and they have all the problems and the progressive, uh, more progressive um, municipalities, they are all fine. But actually Yara has seen quite a lot of far right um, dynamics and, and targeting, maybe because it was so progressive. That's, that's our conclusion. So we looked at the far right actions or dynamics in those three local government areas. Um, that was sort of the starting point, but, but the, the key interest was actually uh, to understand sort of the, the risk factors and also the protective factors within those communities. Why, why, did, the, why did the community respond in a certain way? Why, why did they not respond? Um, what are the, the, the factors that influence these things? So it's not really so much about analyzing exactly the extremist faces of, of those actions, but more um, the, the, the whole environment, the climate, the context, and the structures around it. Um, the report is, is um, you can download the report, it's just, that's how it looks like. Okay, so uh, as I said, I, I want to quickly give um, a bit of context so we are all on the same page. Some people might know these things already quite well, others may not. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, I thought it makes sense to um, focus on Bendigo and Milton for this presentation. Um, and I want to be brief with this context because the really exciting part happens then a bit later, I think. Um, so Bendigo. Bendigo was, I mean, it's well known that there was a mosque conflict. Um, often it's been associated with the United Patriots front and the really nasty side of, um, of those protests. But it actually started uh, way early in January 2014 <clears throat> and dragged on into 2016. Initially, it was an anti-mosque protest that started locally. So there was a local group that was against it and that's often over, overlooked and we often only look at the United Patriots front. It, it started locally, it had the support from lo two local councillors who were 
like firmly embedded in the in the anti-mosque protests, not just as you know silent supporters, sympathizers, but really as active um, figures in in that protest. This took place online and offline. Um, at some point, the external influence increased, so it was increasingly co-opted by far-right nationalist groups that actually didn't care about that mosque in in Bendigo, but they had their own agenda that was much more um, aggressive and um, in many ways extremist, um, I would say. But as we, over the time, it was actually um, a, a new component gained traction and that was that it was not only about uh, the mosque and it was not only a, a, an anti-Islam uh, protest, but it was very much almost equally, maybe even more towards the end, um, a, an anti-council protest. It was, it was what we see now that the far right is, is um, attacking primarily systems or uh, government is the primary enemy. And we saw that on a local level already in Bendigo during that, those protests. So that's sort of the context for the Bendigo um, mosque protest, just in a, in a nutshell. Melton was very different. Same time, um, or roughly the same time, probably, probably uh, slightly later, um, but in Melton, the city council rejected a mosque application and WCAT over, overruled that and, and sent it back to the council and said, you have to, you have to reassess this. Uh, so it, it's, a different, it's, a, it's a different starting point. Um, this, this led to the first um, anti-mosque protests in Melton. The second protest in Melton was also related to, to um, Islam or the Muslim community rather, um, at least on the surface. There were media reports by the um, um, Herald Sun and taken up by the, the TV uh, Current Affairs uh, a few weeks later that there's a new housing development coming up and this is going to be a Muslim housing estate. And that was the trigger for the second protest. Um, it never was a, a Muslim only housing estate, never meant to be like this, but that was uh, irrelevant for the protests obviously. In addition to those um, Islam related protests, there were also um, the racialized gang crimes that was obviously a national or at least statewide debate was particularly with a particular local focus also prevalent in, in uh, Melton and it shaped the discussion a lot. This is not the focus of, of this presentation, but it is the context, it is part of the context. Interestingly, init the, initial uh, the initial protest in 2015 was planned by Reclaim Australia, like an external group, but the local True Blue crew, the TBC, took over and they became the face primarily then. There were other external groups, but basically it was an, a, a local group that, that was at the forefront of those protests. Um, despite that, there was little resonance in the local community, uh, which is interesting because you would think if it comes out of the community, there would be a bit more community connection, but it wasn't. Um, in 2018, and then I finish with the contextualization there, um, the Australian Liberty Alliance uh, thought it's a, good, it's a good moment to sort of revive those protests, but not very successfully. So that was the time when the council had to decide ultimately what to do about the, the mosque. And there was a, a small local protest led by the Australian Liberty Alliance. Avi Yemeni was the face of, of that um, protest. And it, it contributed, uh, according to our, our analysis, to councillors rejecting or deferring the decision on the mosque. So there's still no mosque. So it's, um, it has been basically, um, it's gone. The, the, the whole process is, is over. So um, drawing um, on all three local case studies that we did, like um, all of them, also the one in Yera, we, we came up with a, a few guiding questions that should help us analyze what actually happened when far-right incidents occur. Um, how do we better understand that? And these are some of the questions that we think are central to better understand um, those dynamics. And these are also the questions that, that are go going to guide the next next slide or the, the analysis for us of those three um, local case studies. So the first one is what role have local issues and community grievances played for far-right mobilization in those particular co local contexts? The second one is to what extent were far-right actions imported or organized locally? We mentioned already it's, sometimes it's a mix of both. Um, how did far-right protests, uh, protest messaging um, and the tactics of those protests resonate with the local community. 
going to say something about this. This was really interesting. How does the broader media discourse um, influence the events? I also mentioned already in, in Melton, the, the, the media report from the Herald Sun, for example, that sort of triggered the second protest, but also the, the general media climate around, you know, in, in, in the mid 2000s around ISIS and Islamic terrorism, the moral panic around uh, Islam and its place in, in, in Australia was obviously a strong influencer there. And the last one is how have other local or external actors um, responded to those far right escalations or actions? And this, this is going to guide sort of our, um, the analysis a little bit. So what happened in Bendigo? Um, so after explaining the context a little bit, um, I wanna dig a, bit, a little bit deeper there. So initially in 2014, when it started early 2014, the, the local, it started at the local, the public debate, the sort of the social norms, things that you could say to others, um, strangers on the street or in the supermarket was dominated by the anti-mosque um, camp basically. So that was a really interesting observation that it, people felt, people who were actually in favor of the mosque, they, they felt they couldn't speak out. Um, that was both something we saw online and offline one of the biggest anti-Muslim um, Facebook pages originated from that local mobilization, Stop the Mosque in Bendigo, later renamed Stop the Mosques in Australia, but it started there. The top image that you see on, this, on the right-hand side, the, the weird black balloons, is, is a, I put that there because it, it shows how anti-Mosque um, anti camp or part, people in the anti-Mosque camp tried to actively intimidate the community and those who were in favor of the mosque. So those black balloons were tied to the near houses or at the housing, at the houses of people who were known for their uh, open pro-mosque and pro-diversity stands, including councillors. Um, so that was an, an important, is an important element. The communication process between primarily council and who were seen as the, 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 the gatekeeper of the uh, pro-mosque um, camp um, and the anti-mosque um, segment, segment of, the, of the community. The communication process um, basically broke down um, after, oh, sorry, Try, trying to move the pictures away. Um, it broke down and the count, because it was just too, you know, too aggressive, too confrontational. So the council didn't know how to deal with that. So they basically stopped all communication and consultation processes apart from written, um, uh, um, written feedback or um, consultations. The second image shows how a council meeting co completely um, got out of control and the police had to be called because the anti-mosque protesters sort of stormed in uh, and uh, the councils had to be guided out, not the protesters, the councils had to be brought to safety. Um, so it, it was clear that nothing, that, that this kind of communication didn't, didn't go any further. So the council decided to shut down that conversation. And that escalated the situation further because it, it led to an increased sense of um, silencing and marginalization of those anti-mosque voices. Um, this is the word that I'm struggling with. The Jiu-Jitsu politics is one, of, is one of those words that describe how a democratic institution is trying to sort of deal with the, those um, kind of anti-democratic or quite aggressive racist um, responses, but they do it in a way that actually makes it even worse. Um, then external groups emerged and, and seized the opportunity, United Patriots Front, as I mentioned before, they were seen as sort of the saviors for some part of the, of the Bendigo community. The UPF has given us a voice and the rest of Bendigo, a voice of what we wanted is what one person said. And initially it looked like this could succeed. And even the leader of the United Patriots from Blair Cottrell, he said that it was a successful, um, a, a successful movement. Well, that's what he thought, but ultimately it failed um, miserably, I, I would say. The decline started, um, the de decline started because the UPF ch chose strategies, very confrontational and including violent strategies in their anti-mosque protests. And although many people in Benigo agreed with the, the message of the, the protest, they disagreed 
with the, the strategies and the, the tactics. So the third picture you see, you, you may have heard about the, this uh, fake um, decapitation of, of a, um, a dummy, um, very, very confrontational, very disgusting with fake blood coming out in front of the, the council building. Even those who were in favor, most of those who were, who were against the mosque in Benigo didn't want to see things like that in their streets. The counter mobilization is really in interesting. Initially, it was just a small group mixed of um, a small sort of local mainstream pro-diversity groups, which didn't get much traction and more radical left counter movements that were sort of bust in. It always it sounds always a bit weird, but people coming from Melbourne to support. But it was interesting that the, the, the external um, radical anti-fascist anti groups, they accepted that the locals should lead those protests and that, that, that worked quite well. But the breakthrough in the counter mobilization only happened after the UPF rally. And that was like one and a half years later after the, after the, the, the protests have started. Um, because the UPF rally was not what Bendigonians wanted to see. It was seen as a stain on the local community. And that initiated a completely new response from large segments of the community. It was driven by um, local, local business people who basically created um, the Believe in Bendigo platform, a pro-diversity platform, and they managed to completely change the, the public climate and the club public, the social norms in Bendigo through their activities. You see that at the, at the bottom, the yellow was, became their, their sort of their, their symbolic color. They explicitly did not refer to the UPF and not even too much about the mosques. They didn't want to be dragged into that, into that polarized space. They just said, we are pro-diversity, we are, we, are, we, are, we, we are inclusive, we are, we are, um, multi, we are proud multicultural um, Bendigonians. The political leadership was supportive of that, the council, but it was not the main driver. And that was probably a good thing because the, the council has lost all credibility in, in those segments of the community, in the local community um, that were skeptical or against the mosque. So um, at the same time, those, those events, the, the mosque events were an, an enormous catalyst for long-term commitment in the local uh, council to diversity and inclu inclusion. And, um, we saw that this has changed the way the council thinks about its approach to diversity fundamentally. Um, I think last month or a few months ago, Bendigo was, was the first uh, Australian city that was accredited as a welcoming city by the by Welcoming Australia, a, a network of um, a, a city network in Australia, the biggest one. So it making, made enormous progress. So they turned the, the, the sort of the, the climate around, but that doesn't mean that people who previously were against the most all of a sudden were in favor. And that's sort of the, the critical part of this, that it helped silence anti-Islam voices in Bendigo, but it didn't make them go away. Maybe a few less, but they, our interpretation is that they contracted into more political, committed, politically and ideologically committed, some would say radicalized, um, far right segments um, in, the, in the community and, and protests have gone on uh, since then um, against the mosques, very small, but very dedicated. Um, and when we looked at the electoral outcomes, we saw that 10% voted for far right parties, including Fraser Ennings and, and um, Pulin Hansen's One Nation Party. But they are silenced and that's an important element and we're gonna come back to that in a second. This one is a bit, hopefully a bit shorter, the, the presentation about the, the situation in, in Melton. Uh, as I said before, it, the trigger was completely different. The trigger was that the council was actually rejecting um, a mosque application, not um, pushing or, or sort of were positive or have tried to, wanted to approve the, the mosque or did approve. It was um, started in 2015, the True Blue crew, um, sort of took the rain from Reclaim Australia, as I said before, but with little traction. Everyone was surprised in Melton. No one knew, some, someone said that when they heard there was a protest in Melton, they thought that the, the, the news misspelled Melton, actually Melbourne, but um, they soon learned that this was not the case and that um, it, it attracted quite a big crowd. Um, the response was very different or the counter, sort of the counter movement, because the response was, Law enforcement heavy, stronger, more than in, 
than we've seen before proportionally. And it was dominated only by radical, when I say radical, I'm not saying this in a judgmental sense. I'm just saying that this is an inter, interfascist dedicated um, socialist groups that, um, that organized the counter protests. Um, that there, was no, there was no or hardly any local involvement in those counter protests. Interestingly, I also spoke to people from who were involved in the counter protests and they were also not welcome in, in, in Milton, maybe even less than the True Blue crew. So they were, they were also harassed by locals um, on their way to the bus and to the train station. Um, so basically there was no local counter mobilization. It was complete apathy. Um, people I spoke to from Milton said that the average person in Melton couldn't care less about those protests. It was not their fight, as one person said. The local council was a bit torn, didn't know what to do at this point. Um, ultimately, they uh, permanently deferred the mosque decision in April 2018. And the people that, I, that we interviewed for the study, they said there were two sort of interpretations, but very similar. The first one, is reflected in the in the quote on the left. You wouldn't want to say yes, meaning that the council wouldn't want to say yes to the to the mosque, because that's when the trouble would start again. The trouble meaning the, the right wingers would come again. And obviously there wasn't enough support for the mosque to push it through. Like a very interesting and um, distorted idea of democracy, completely ignoring minority rights. So majority rights rules and nothing else. Others were also even within councils um, were critical of or. The interpretation was that the council uh, deferred the mosque decision because they were looking for a reason to defer. They didn't want to face it. And they were also intimidated by, by the protests. Um, the, the, as I mentioned before, that the, the broader context was um, in 2018 and 16, 17, 18, that the, the racialized um, gang crime um, discourse in that was a very, very strong element in, in Melton. And many people I spoke to mentioned that it's even more important for them than the mosque protests themselves. And the, the, the sort of one of the key conclusions was that there was, there was a certain level of permissiveness to, to racism in the local community, obviously not everyone. Um, one person said, not everyone in Melton is racist by any means, but there's a very permissive context for racism. And when you look at the, the famous, almost notoriously famous um, picture at the very bottom, a shop owner put that in his, in his window um, after he got um, robbed by um, Australian African, young Australian Africans. Um, there's a footage that shows that. And then, then he put that sign in there. There was. The sign is one thing, but there was not a, there's not there wasn't much backlash against the sign saying that um, 14 to 18 year old blacks and dogs are not allowed in the shop. So in a way, the Melton looks a bit bad in in terms of their response. But actually, I have to say that Melton has probably um, shown the most dedicated um, or the, the greatest dedication to change the approach to. Um, intercultural inclusiveness and things like that. And they have come a long way since then. So in case there's someone in the audience, I, I'm, not, um, I'm not saying that Melton is, I, I would actually say Melton has done an amazing job to come out of this and they've learned their lesson in a very, very short period of, of time, if I can say so. Just check any time. Okay, time values. So this is now the slide where I think it would be good to, um, to have like sort of a conversation as well. So, I mean, I, I, I don't know how you wanna do that, Sam, if someone wants to jump in, I'm not, I don't see anyone, but um, feel free to dis in interrupt if you, if you feel like it. Maybe I start with the first and then we can go through the, the, the individual dot points if that's okay. Sounds good. Okay, thanks. So I mentioned the, the, the locally specific grievances. That's for us really important to understand that we are not, this is not in a, in a national, we, we have to approach that in the, with the specifics of the local community. And one of the things that, that um, sort of became very clear is that in, in the Bendigo case, for example, Bendigo has, has undergone an enormous um, sort of socioeconomic transformation, also cultural transformation. When I say cultural, I don't mean in terms of minority groups, 
as, as such, not, not demographically, but the, the whole culture in Bendigo, the socioeconomic transformation in Bendigo has, has cha well, obviously changed Bendigo a lot. Me, people mentioned the new Bendigo. The new Bendigo is the Bendigo of the art galleries, the Bendigo of uh, the, the, um, the graffiti, um, nicely graffiti um, coffee lanes, a bit like in the city, or it's almost like a Viera, a uh, city of Viera sort of feel with coffee culture and um, museums and things like that, the wineries, tourism, that brought new opportunities to some and changed the way Bendigonians, many Bendigonians perceived themselves. But it also um, resulted in a, at least a perceived lack of status and privilege of others, more working class, um, sort of value conservative people um, who felt like from, and that's a quote, for no fault of my own, I have been left behind. Um, these are new grievances that I, we think played a role in the, in the mosque conflict as well. Um, so the, Hyde mentioned uh, the, the dichotomy between status quo conservatives and um, progressive liberal globalists. And I mean, although I'm not a big fan of this rigid um, kind of looking at this, but a, a little bit of this is uh, we saw in, in Bendigo as, as well. In Melton, and maybe I can have, have stop there then after that quickly, we saw an enormous transformation in terms of, um, in terms of demographic changes very, very quickly. Uh, Melton previously Anglo-wide predominantly has become a very, very diverse neighborhood, like as almost super diverse uh, or neighborhoods. Um, and the people who moved to Melton were not recent arrivals. There were people who, who were showed a lot of upward mobility, people who had saved money and bought their first house. I mean, obviously that's, that's a big, I mean, that doesn't apply to all of them, but uh, many of them bought new houses in the new developments um, beautiful, you know, infrastructure and 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 environment, um, and others felt that they, they lost status as well. So that's similar, but the the driver were different. So one interview partner said, when people drive past these new developments, they're mainly um, non-Anglo um, new arrivals or new newcomer new residents live. They drive, their, past, they drive past there every day and they see those nice cars and houses and everything that constantly reminds people of their resentment. So I think that was a really important um, element of those local grievances. Maybe I can, I can stop there and, and see if there's anything, if anyone wants to comment on that. Gives me a little bit of break too. Just unmute yourself if you if you would like to say something, and I can also continue, obviously. It's because I can't see you. Then I, I doesn't to... doesn't okay, look, okay, I... look like we've got any pressing questions yet, but maybe. <laughs> okay, then the second part. I, I mentioned a little bit. I mean, I mentioned the counter mobilization. For me, one of the fundamental questions was. Why didn't we see any counter mobilization, counter movements against the far right uh, protests in Melton? Um, it took a while in, in, in Bendigo as well uh, until they emerged. So time is certainly an issue because the, the whole protest was more, was longer over a longer period of time in Bendigo. But I don't think that this was the only reason. Um, I think it has something to do and that's, that's what our, research um, suggests very strongly with um, the civil society structure and civil engagement in general. Um, we have a very um, underdeveloped civil society structure in Melton, also given the, the rapid growth of the, of the, of the, of the, the, the community. Um, it takes a while, obviously, until you establish those new organizations, new neighborhood groups, and things like that. Um, um, we looked at volunteering rates, for example, and that's, that was a, um, a quite strong um, difference in Melton, one of the lowest in the state, 12.5 um, according to the census in 2016, whereas Bendigo is 23.1, much, much higher. Um, someone in, in Melton said to me that um, 
this kind of pro-diversity activism, you know, standing up for multiculturalism, this is the hobby of the affluent and educated people like those in Vienna, but not us. So it, it, it tells us a lot about their self-perception and their self-image. Um, we are not affluent, we are not educated, and, that, and therefore we, we don't want to stand up for pro-diversity. It's a hobby. Um, I, I thought that was very um, interesting. And another more structural factor is the question of time. I mean, volunteering research, you know, repeatedly and very consistently emphasizes that time is an issue. People in, in Bendigo, they live and work in Bendigo, they don't commute far usually. They, they, don't, lo they don't lose a lot of time. They have, they have more time resources during the day. Whereas in Melton, most of them commute to the city. They are stuck in traffic. Catching the train is, is, is horrific, takes forever. Someone said to me, they come home at 7.30 in the evening and they don't have any energy to do anything else. Um, someone also said they don't even have time for to cook. That's why Melton has apparently the highest um, uh, ratio of uh, fish and chip shops. I'm not sure whether this is true, but that's what someone said to me, because people are just too tired. Local pride and positive local identification is something that we found to be a very strong influencer in, in um, the, whether a community is, is um, sort of resilient or vulnerable to exclusivist divisive ideologies. In Bendigo, people, I mentioned the, the quote before, the, the protests were staying on the community. This is, people were not indifferent towards how their communities was being portrayed in the media and even internationally. And they said, well, this is enough. Uh, we are better than this is something that was a few people said repeatedly. That there was a strong pride in the multicultural history with you know, during the gold rush, the Chinese, there was a strong pride that came out of this history. Whereas in Melton, the self-perception, although most people that I spoke to like Melton very much, but they said the perception is a city, it's a town of bogans. We're just, you know, crime is, is big and, you know, no one wants to live here. It's awful. I like it, but no one else does. And we are just sort of scum, seen as such. It's not worth fighting for. A, a community like this. And that's one of the reasons a negative local identity, um, not feeling particularly connected to your local connected, uh, um, neighborhood and community um, is certainly, or appears to be a factor that influences the, the propensity to, to engage and to stand up for your community in, in, in terms of countering far right or being vulnerable to their um, mobilization. There are a couple of questions in the oh, yeah. chat there, Mario, if you can yeah. see those. I can't. Can you? Uh, yeah. So the first one oh, yeah. uh, is from Neil Minnie saying a comment saying that it's really seeing in the analysis the arise of white grievance politics and revenkism. Yeah. Uh, and the question from Rita was just wondering if volunteering was low, why far right activism was high, given that it would also involve volunteering. <laughs> yeah, that's a good. It's a good point. Um, well, um, you don't need many people for those far right protests to, um, to you know, to, to create um, some traction. I mean, there were 50 people from Melton who were um, active members of the True Blue crew. So I, I don't think that they would consider themselves to be um, volunteers. Um, they were certainly political politically active, most of them, at least of all of them by, by default almost. But um, I mean, it, it, it's just one factor. It doesn't mean, it doesn't explain things, the volunteering rate as such, but it is a, an, one of many factors that help us understand the general climate and the general um, inclination to stand up, to do something also in terms of, you know, commitment to your local community. Um, I hope that explains that a little bit. And the white grievances, I mean, that's, I think that's at, at the core that, that socioeconomic factors um, obtain a different dimension. You, you look for other, um, you know, explanations. I don't think that they would, uh, you know, firebomb a, um, a museum or I mean, graffiti uh, a binary because they had, it's just a sense that they are losing, they're losing something. I think, I don't, think that this is often very um, explicit or, or conscious. They, they are not in the, they just often feel, and I interviewed quite a few people in Bendigo who, who 
who are in the far right corner, they just feel like they are losing out. They, the, the Bendigo is pushing an agenda that is not theirs and it wasn't theirs 10 years ago. So why is, where is this all coming from? And my voice is not heard anymore. And it's partly because the Bendigo Council responded to, to that this way. I mean, we, I'm gonna come back to that at the end of the slide. Um, so the grievance is, is something that we need to take seriously if you wanna do something about it. Um, I, I think I'm going to come back to that in, in, a, in a moment. It's almost, almost done with the slide and then we can talk a bit more, I think. Um, in, related to the, the question of local pride and positive identity is the, the question of personal and structural connectedness. And um, I mentioned before, it, it does make a difference and it has been made very clear to us in the, in the, in the research, whether you live where you work. You have a, it's not only the commuting itself, but it's also how you, how you identify with your space. If you spend all your time basically in the community, work and after work, it's a different, a different form of connectedness to that community. Um, there's an interesting, there was an interesting study, that's the second that dot point down there about the ethno religious diversity and segregation. An interesting study from the UK, from Bix and Knauss in 2013, they found leaked membership data from uh, the British Nationalist Party, like a far right party, pretty um, extreme, or well, radical right wing party. And they found the membership list which leaked and they analyzed where the people lived the, who were predominant, predominantly lived those who joined the party. And what they found is that they lived in places in, the, in England primarily um, where there's a high level of diversity, but at the same time, there's also a high level of ethnic segregation. That means you, the, 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 the area might be diverse, but within the, those diverse neighborhoods, there are pockets that are segregated. So in a way, that's how I see this, this you, you see the other, but the other remains a threat because there's no engagement with the other, for example. Um, and that's also the interpretation from Bix and Knaus that there's an increased threat perception, but reduced interpersonal contact opportunities. And that together contributed, or at least that's the argument, um, played a role in um, a, a greater vulnerability or propensity to join the, the British Nationalist Party. When we apply that, and I'm, I mean, we have to be cautious, we can't apply that to, to Australian, directly to Australian, um, or even to the case studies there. But when we look at Melton, I'm not sure who, how well you know Melton, but there's a, a, a new development in Melton, divided, it's, it's in Rockbank, it's divided by the freeway, but it's still Rockbank, both sides of the freeway. One side is, is pr predominantly Anglo-white, has always been there for a long time. On the other side, it's predominantly um, a new like emerging communities. Um, I think it's pred predominantly Indian communities. So you have Rockbank as a diverse, if you look at the statistics, it's a diverse community, but it's highly segregated. That would be a, uh, that would resonate with what Bix and Knaus found. I'm not saying that they all joined um, a nation party or whatever, but this is, this, this is an example. Um, in terms of personal and structural connectedness, I put the structural in there because a lot of this is, is, is at least partially connected to or related to and caused by urban and spatial planning. So planning, uh, urban planning plays a major role and that, that's, there, there are so many different facets to that from housing design to how you zone certain areas um, in, in new developments and how you set up public spaces where people can come together. Um, zoning, for example, if there is if the new developments have, for example, no place for local shopping anymore. So people don't go out and meet each other when they go shopping. They have to go to the to the big shopping centers that are outside the neighborhood. Um, the housing design, I mean, I mentioned that before, it's one of my favorite examples where even the housing design influences the way people feel connected. For example, in many areas in the new development in, in Melton, you drive after a long day at work and two hours on, in, you know, in, in, in traffic, you, you drive into your driveway, into your garage and you walk from the garage into your house. You do not even go around, the, you don't see anything. You don't, you don't engage with the neighbor because you do not even see the neighbor because you walk directly from your car into the, into the kitchen. Um, the fish and chips are already waiting for the beer or you bought them. Um, 
So these things all play a role in the way we engage and interact in our local neighborhood, and that influences the way we feel connected. And ultimately, it also has an impact on the way we, we, we feel about our neighborhood. And do we, are we willing to stand up for our neighborhood if someone external comes in and, and claims that, like reclaim Australia using their name? So, so there was um, some comments. Sam, did you? Uh, there was a, a, um, a follow-up from Rita's question about um, the difference. Was that was there wasn't any difference amongst far-right groups in terms of having more time? So this idea that they they perhaps had different conditions which enabled them to to be more proactive. Oh, no, I don't. I don't think that. I mean, I don't know whether they have more time um, in in volunteering. It's 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 interesting that because people who, who you would think have more time, I, I think that's a misperception. People who are unemployed, they are less engaged in volunteering, um, not more, although you could say they have more time, but I don't think that this would actually be true because they have other things. I mean, they have to apply for jobs and doing other things. So I don't wanna imply that they just sit at home and don't do anything. Um, but there was, I don't know whether they have more time really um, to enable them to do that. I think there's, that's not the main factor for that. Uh, the, there was another uh, comment just from um, Amber Cassidy's uh, saying that your description of the segregation challenge makes sense why the intercultural framework that Melton has been working on for the past years is potentially effective. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Hi, Amber, by the way. <laughs> I mean, it's not far from where I am at the moment. Um, I think that's, a, that's, that's what I meant before that Melton has, has pulled it around and I've realized that the, they have to respond differently and they have done an amazing job in, in responding to that um, and they are it's one of the few and I think it was the first council that adopted an intercultural framework as opposed to a diversity multicultural framework um, very very important to do that when we compare that for example to Yera maybe that's an interesting um, the third case study where you have high density uh, people live together. You can't avoid contact with diversity. It's it's part of your everyday life. It's it's normalized, as they said to me in Yara. It just happens not naturally. And you have um, high density, a high diversity, and there's no segregation. You you have a social housing areas with um, particularly high density, which is predominant, very diverse. Um, but they those social housing estates and um, areas they are quite. In, well integrated into the, the broader community. So there are festivals at the, the estates, for example. So they are part of it. It's not, um, it's not segregated like what I said before about the, the Melton um, incident, uh, um, or incident structure in Rock Bank, the freeway that divides them. Okay, so I, I make a note of that intercultural or maybe the intercultural um, framework in Melton, and then come back to that if that's okay. There was one comment about the intercultural framework. Um, the political lead, I mean, it, I think I'm just checking the time. I think that's the political leadership. Um, what I said before in Bendigo, for example, it pushed, it started to push a progressive agenda. Some people in my in, in the fieldwork said that. This is the loud Bendigo against the local sentiment. So the question is, how far do you want to go in, in as a local as a local government to educate and promote um, progressive agendas if your local community may not like that? So you might um, it might disenfranchise some people. So local um, government have to um, find a balance between being openly and you know explicitly. Um, progressive in their agenda and not losing the voices that may disagree with them. So it's really important to bring them all along. Um, in Bendigo, my sense is, and that's and that's based on also the research, it's not just a personal uh, feeling, is that there is a significant proportion of the community that feels silenced now and um, they hate the council because they feel like the council does not represent them at all. That's not a good environment. Maybe it's good for the public climate in general because they don't get the right to speak up, but it's not good for the community for community relations in general. And that leads me to the last point. 
the most controversial one, maybe that's why I left it to the end. Um, how do we respond to those that disagree with the progressive agenda and maybe even those who express racist views? Um, the one example um, that I always use is a, a, youth, cl a, a youth club in Yera um, where a person comes in and expresses racist views. Um, what do we do with that young person? Do we, do we um, send, send him away and say, we don't want you here anymore in that youth work? Obviously, we don't want to endorse that and give racism a platform, but how do we deal with individuals who have such views? Do we engage with them? And if so, how? Is there a chance to transform those conflicts, those tensions into something bigger or better? That's a big question, how to do that. Um, it's probably something that needs to be done on a, on a, on a, a personal level, like between two people, not uh, as a collective, not as a group. Um, but that's question, these are questions that um, are quite important, I think. I, I mean, that's, that's pretty much um, it. I mean, I, this is not so important. It just shows you the segregation in, in Melton, just as an example. But otherwise, that's, um, that's all I wanted to say. And maybe we have at least five, six, seven minutes for questions or yeah there's some other um marks put a question in the the chat there about what you think the the role that the timing of the mosque application played in the mobilization of the far right um i it was at the height of the the caliphate and the threat from islamic extremism was a key part of the political discourse at the time yeah yeah it played a central role but not only for Mel Melton and Bendigo, but, but for the whole discourse around, or the whole rise of the, of the new far right has started there. And we know that many nationalist groups that are now openly um, fascist, like National Socialist um, Network, for example, they have their roots there. At least that's how many of them met. Um, and they just used that uh, anti-Islam narrative to promote and recruit more. And they openly said, you know, let's focus on the Muslims now and we come back to the Jews later. So that we have like quotes that, that indicate that there's, that has been used by, by, the, by far right. Um, and uh, the intercultural, um, someone asked about the intercultural um, framework in Melton, just briefly. Um, I think you can, you can find that on their website. I mean, the general idea is that it's not about um, or the focus of an intercultural agenda or framework as opposed to other diversity agendas, although I mean, the differences are often not, not so great, but the focus is bringing different communities more together instead of um, supporting them separately. And initially, um, Melton tried to do that, like they had one program for the Africans and they have one program for this, and it didn't really, it didn't really work. Um, so they moved towards um, a st stronger focus on bringing different cultures, cultural groups emerging and communities together and also empowering. That was something that they realized. It's the council is more like a facilitator of, of those uh, processes and um, enables those processes, but it's ultimate, it's something that has to be driven by the community and the different community groups themselves. Sorry, I get, um, can I close the... The screen, or does anyone want to refer to some specifics on the on the slides? Does anyone have an? Uh, I was going to say an in person, <laughs> a, a live question they'd like to ask. Uh, Sam, uh, I, 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 I've got a sort of a question. Um, thank, thank you, Maria. Maria, that was yeah, that was great to hear about all of that work. And as you were talking, I was thinking about about privilege place and people's ideas and connections to land and so forth. And I wondered, in all of this, um, does matters about indigenous sovereignty arise in any of the discourses and how might that influence it? And even how does that relate to or link to the intercultural framework? Um, I don't actually know about it, but it'd be interesting to think about where that sits in relation to that, because a lot of this, I think, and I think Nomini points this out, is through this the sense of white grievance, you know, and I'm thinking, well, what does it look like from, a, from another perspective? And is that perspective um, e evident in any of this? It, it didn't come up often, the, the question of indigenous um, communities and, and their status, but in the, in the interviews it did, in the interviews with people from the far right, and in Bendigo, uh, also in the context of 
um, you know, the council wants to push a progressive agenda, but when it comes to um, responding to Australia Day, for example, they were very, very reluctant to go there. They said, let's, let's, let's not go there. That's, yeah, we acknowledge that it is a controversial thing, but we still celebrate Australia Day the way we, we've always done it. So there are tensions where, well, this, this kind of narrative reaches um, a limit in, in the local um, leadership where they don't where they feel uncomfortable there's certainly a, a, a strong sense of discomfort that is not a positive sense of discomfort because it's sort of paralyzed they say this is this is going too far um, in the in the interviews that we conducted with far-right people from the communities um, they have a strong sense that they are all pro-indigenous and the real indigenous want Australia Day. I mean I'm not I'm using Australia Day as an example like assimilationist views of indigenous communities, as long as they support our views, it's great to have them on board. But I mean, it was driven by, 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 by the white, white dominance, by white um, privilege and white, white power. You know, when I say white power, it's not that white power, but um, the sense of ha having control of the narratives of what Australia or our local community is. Thanks, Mario. Mario, you did say that report is available now, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. I think someone was uh, asking about that. So, Mario, will you um, will you be able to share these slides, or we can just point uh, people to access the report via the link in it, or we can put the link oh, yeah, up on the, the yeah the slides are. Um, or we can just put the link up on the Citroen site uh, where your talk is and people yep. can download it from there. The only thing is that, um, that the, the, four, the images that I used, some of them or many of them are from sort of, you know, they're not mine, they're from the internet, from ABC or SBS. So no, okay, we don't want to get you in trouble for free copyright. <laughs> so we'll, we'll internet, just take the link. <laughs> if you use it internally, I have no, I have no problem with that. Okay. Is that it, Sam? Looks like it. I just um, before I I, th I thank Mario. I just wanted to uh, let people know our our next um, seminar, which I think is going to be around the twenty second of April, uh, one o'clock, is going to be Dr. Pilar Kassat from Curtin University, and it's titled "Nobody Gets to Rewrite These Things." These are my histories, epistemologies of women of colour in art for social change, which should be amazing. So um, uh, we will post details of that uh, on the website. But uh, I think we're finished and there's lots of thanks in the chat for Mario and um, thanks. thanks. I, hope I, didn't, I hope I didn't talk too much. I mean, I did. Really. I know I did actually. <laughs> <laughs> it, was all, it was all good chat though, Mario. It was terrific. Thank you. That's, That's it, great. Uh, um, and maybe we'll get Nomini uh, who's made some comments there to uh, come and speak to us as, uh, as well at some point. <laughs> I mean, feel free obviously to get in touch um, and I mean, you can always have a conversation about these things as well. Um, Time is always, in presentations, I mean, time is always scarce. But thank, thank you. Thank you, Mario. Thanks, Mario. Uh, thanks, everyone, for right. joining us.